How you doing? Good. How you doing? Great as usual. <laughs> You're doing well? I'm doing excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, everyone, hello and welcome to episode 18 of The Harvest, where we discuss everything cinema and story. And as we learn, you learn. As we grow, you grow. We have a two-parter this week. Yes, we are going to take you on a journey. On a <laughs> We're going to take you on a journey through our writing process. You'll yes, see will. amused by my antics. That was great. I was already... Uh, You're in it? Yeah, I was in it. Floating? Yeah. On the journey. All right, so from research and story set up through the actual writing all the way to revising and editing a final draft, we've created for ourselves something that works for us, a very specific method um, for writing. And we did that by learning from others and learning even from our own mistakes. Right. Um, writing is not one size fits all. So what works for us may not work for everyone. Nevertheless, over the course of many projects scripted either for commercial, branding, marketing, and mm -hmm. advertising, uh, for on stage theater, which we, you know, and, and for film, all of which we've done a lot, over the course of all those projects, we've discerned that there's a little bit of truth being preached by all your major screenplay gurus. All of them have some sort of truth to them. Yeah. Now, today, we're here to talk about how we've gathered all of that and made our own process. Right. Um, part one, this is part one, where we're going to take you through the research and the setup. You ready? Let's do it. All right, let's do this. So, first and foremost, one thing that I want to just right off the bat jump into discussing is a routine and setting up a routine, which is different than setting up like a structure. I think people sometimes, you know, when they think structure or story structure, you know, immediately there's some sort of a apprehension to it because they're like, no, there's no such thing as like a set structure for story. Um, you know, and there, there will be your Save the Cats, Blake Snyder's, all the way right. to your Robert McKee's that are on opposite ends of the spectrum saying there is no structure or there's a very specific structure to writing. I'm going to step back from that, though. I'm talking more so about your routine to step into the writing process and to go through the writing, including all of the creative back work that needs to happen before you're actually writing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I want to ask you right off the bat, Jonathan. How important is it to you, for you personally, to have a routine that you can always rely on? You know, you're sitting there, you're staring at the blank page or, or the cursor's blinking in your face and you're about to write your first word. Talk to me about your routine before you even get into that and how important routine is for you. Well, I think routine is very important. Um, for me, it is the essence of comfort. Um, it's what gives me the confidence to begin the process uh, to have a empty mind in the sense of being able to fill it in with everything that has to do with the particular film, commercial project, whatever film project it is. I think to be able to um, have everything from the day out of your mind, you know, you know, I got two kids, family, home, and all these different scenarios. For you to be able to focus on that particular project, you need to be able to have a good routine, something yeah. that gets you right into the project. Yeah. And by routine, we're, like we're talking like a workflow. Like yeah. there's a there's there's a there's an order to how you're gonna go about to write and to right. get into the writing process. And and there's there's a start, there's a work, and there's yeah. a stop. Right. And it's all structured so that everyone knows, including yourself, hey, I'm in writing mode, mm -hmm. right? And I completely agree. In fact, there's so much to routine that I personally think is extremely important. I mean, you said this, it, 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 when you have a routine and you start your routine, you know that there's going to be an actual starting point. I think with writers, one of the biggest fears or sometimes even anxieties for writers is my first word. Yeah. You know, because everyone knows like your first page you know, is, is the most important. If you lose them in your first page, then like you, what's the point of writing the other 119, mm -hmm. you know? And so like that first word, it's oftentimes like causes anxiety for some people. Sure. And I think if you have a routine and you've got, and you've established your mind to falling into that routine, you write that first word as part of your routine and you know, look, 
You've established the process. You know you're going to go back. You're going to correct that. That first word is not do or die. You just get into your routine, get the thing started, and get the thing going. I think routine helps with the starting point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, uh, you know, before, like you said, before you even put your hands on the keyboard or before you put your, you know, hands with a pencil, um, you have to start off with something that is going to allow you to zone in to exactly what it is you're going to be writing or yeah. drawing about. Um, I think one of the things that I do um, is uh, I think for me, music is a big thing. Yeah. Um, I think also uh, as, as a man of faith, I think entering into prayer, I know that we do that a lot of times when it's a very yeah, heavy project, um, when it's going to be very serious or something very important that needs to be said or done. We want to make sure that we're in alignment uh, with God and, and everything that we're about to put on paper is, 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 is exactly what needs to be on there. Um, and so we enter in that way. Um, you know, you have your coffees, you have your things, you have your drinks. Um, uh, you have to also, you, you know, that you want to have something in your stomach. You know, you don't want to be able to go into something where <laughs> yeah, you're. That's that's for you. A- a- you, you yeah, you, you don't want to go in achy. Right. Yeah, okay. Okay. You, okay. you don't want to go in with it with two minds. You know, you only want to go in with one. You're right. I own, like that. You know? I like so, that. Yeah. When your stomach is cre- screaming out, ah, yeah. feed me. Ah, exactly. You know? <laughs> All right. you know, you got your snacks. I know you love your Jolly Ranchers and, and Sour Patch Kids. You right. know, when right. this is not an advertisement, by the way. This is just stuff we like. Yeah. Um, so Skills. I think that, um, you know, those things are important so that yeah. you can. Uh, keep because you know the body is made up of all these senses yeah. you know uh the the mind the will and the emotion uh and for you to keep those uh kind of in check in check um working content, for you. yeah yeah um so that you are able to focus on what's important um they're actually very necessary yeah. in your writing process. No like one really that. thinks about, yeah, they are. you know, about your senses, you know, the smelling, the touching, the tasting, the hearing, um, all your senses, um, you're seeing, you yeah. know, what are you, what's around you when you're about to start writing? Are yeah. you in a dark room? Uh, do you want lights inside of your yeah. room? Um, you know, like are the windows open where you're smelling the flowers? Is someone cooking? You know, yeah. these are all things that you have to think about. It's very similar to like an editor, for example. Like if you're a color corrector, you can't just be sitting in a bright room with white walls, you know, people walking around behind you with a dim, you know, like the environment. Yeah. You know, first and foremost, you need a calibrated monitor. It needs to be right. the right color scheme. You know, you need, be. you know, dark walls. Yeah. You can't have like confusing colors and things flashing behind you. You can't have like, you know, like you, you the environment needs to be conducive for the task at hand. And I, at hand. And I think that's something that we both really appreciate, you know, like every, some people have their writer's chair, you know, like I go yeah. in my comfy writing chair. This is my writing You're gonna chair. You're going to be on that this thing for hours. Space. So yeah, yeah. that thing better be comfortable. Or, or some people, you know, like they, they like to have a room, for example, with a view, like I need to have the ocean in front of me or I need yeah. to have the woods in front of me, you yeah. know, I, or, or, or if I'm going to be writing, my routine is I shut off my phone, I shut off the internet, I shut off the distractions, my, my family knows this is writing time, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm going to be kind of locked away, I'm going to be gone. And you set that up as part part of like your daily routine because then you know well a bunch of things kind of happen you set up parameters you set up parameters and now you know that when you're in those parameters you can come out of those parameters mm-hmm. and so like for example you have safeguarded that time not just for the writing but then you've safeguarded that time also so that you can come out of it and be with friends be with mm-hmm. family be yeah. with your loved ones be with your spouse be yeah. with your children yeah. and if you set up those parameters and you set up that routine mm-hmm. you can be in the routine and you can be out of the routine. But if there's no routine, it's like, when are you writing? When are you not? You know, there's no walls. There's no parameters. Everything can be a distraction. Anything can be a distraction and throws you off your writing yeah, game. Absolutely. And I think that's super important about a routine. It sets up walls. Yeah. It sets up a parameter. And a routine doesn't necessarily mean that you can't do other things that are going to help you with the story. So, for instance, like... I'll have my food, my, my snacks, my computer, my, whether it's my laptop or on my computer station. Um, however, if I'm writing a, uh, a love story, for instance, and um, I say, you know what, I'm going to go to the coffee shop and I'm going to watch people and how they go yeah. on dates and how they interact and I want to start writing and see their facial expressions. 
those that's not so much routine but that's actually going to start helping you with your story so it doesn't necessarily mean that your routine you have to be in that computer room you have to be locked in no you can think outside of the box to take yourself places but know yourself where right. things are going to affect you and distract you from actually writing the story so anything that helps you write the story is what you should start adding to your routine. So are you saying that your routine can be modular? That yes. it doesn't need to be so strict that this is what and how and when and where exactly every single time, but based on the project, right. maybe, you know, based on the genre, based on whatever it is, the writing assignment, the routine can be modular, modular and change and shift in order for you to make room and make space for uh, the inspirations, Correct. the ideologies, right. the I, you know whatever it is that you need in order to get this thing written. I agree, and I couldn't agree with that m more. I, I think something that it helps even is like to kind of keep you on track, you know. And I think that's kind of a you know because you have a routine and you've established from the beginning that your routine is I'm going to go to the coffee shop and I'm going to observe. Mm -hmm. I'm going to observe. I'm going to observe social interactions. I'm going to observe, you know, like couples and blah, 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 because I'm writing this love story. You know, you've now got your parameters. You've now got your uh, your, your your work flow yeah. and you can navigate through it. And now you know where's your beginning, middle and end of your, of your routine, right. your day. Right. It's like when you end up going modular into different locations, no... Know your squirrel mo moments. That's basically what <laughs> it is. Like when, 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 when the dog is running around, I mean, sees a squirrel, it's completely distracted. Just yeah, yeah. know your squirrel moments, things that are going to completely distract you from focusing on what you need to do. And that's awesome because that's, that, that was one of the points that I wanted to hit is because a routine is a routine, right? A routine is a control. It's you've got your beginning. You've got your work and you've got your end, you know, like, so you know how your routine begins, you know how your routine is going to end. And in the middle of that is your productivity. It's right. your workflow. And because you have that, you have, it's kind of like setting goals and, and, and training. We compare a lot of things to like track and field and training, you know, because of our collegiate NCAA, you know, track history. And you know that in order to jump 40, you know, 49, 50 in the triple jump, you, in order to get to that, there's a certain, there's a, there's a certain routine, there's a certain training regimen, and you have specific markers and specific points to get to that, mm -hmm. right? And if you don't hit them, then you can assess, okay, what went wrong? What were the squirrel moments? You know, like what distracted me? What, and because there's a set and there's a standard, you know, like the scientific method, you know, you've got numbers, you've got figures, you've got data. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the best way to say it. you've got data, right. a controlled environment to know when you, when you went off track, when you were on track, what works, what doesn't work, and you can then negate squirrel moments. You're laughing because you've got something funny. Yeah, to no, say. I just, I'm just thinking that you brought me to track, and I remember like the clap. Everyone knows yes, the clap had to be part of the perfect. routine. Yeah, you know, it's like that, bum, 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 and then it increases the speed. If one or two people were off, off you're like, like, stop, stop. I turn routine's around off. and do the whole <laughs> routine over again. Yeah. And, and it's true because it's so mental. It, yeah. it, it's so mental. And you don't want to have any writer's block. Yeah. You don't want to have a mental block. Yeah. And look, and if a, and if a routine, it, you can discern, you know, like, sometimes it's tough, though. You know, like, you... you you sometimes people become sticklers about routines yeah. and then they become more focused on the routine than they do. Look, that's yeah. just an aid. That's just something that you're setting up to help you. And so like, you got to also be able to like be flexible yeah. with the Let process because yeah. sometimes, for example, let's say you've got your routine and you've got it set up and the family knows this is routine. Right. This is writing time. Right. Your son may come in with an emergency right. and you know what? Like you got to be flexible to break the routine. It's not about mm -hmm. the routine. Mm -hmm. The routine is just an aid, just like anything else. Right. Just like final draft is just an aid to writing. Do you need final draft to write? No, it's an aid. It's a tool. The routine is a tool and we can't become so overwhelmed about the tool in and of itself that then that becomes a hindrance as well. Yeah. Because when you're doing commercial work, you'll have to do some, uh, or, or when you're doing, uh, uh, episodes or shows yeah, or television you, yeah. you, you got to write on set and you, you got to be on the spot yeah. and you know you may not be in your nice cozy spot right um, and you got to be able to have that ability to produce yeah. and create content outside of your your routine so yeah. routine again is perfect it's it's an aid that's going to get your mind focused on what you need to do. I was thinking of just discomforts that happen 
you know, sometimes when, like, you, if you don't set up your routine, you know, your squirrel moments or distraction moments or, like, if you haven't had the, your cup of coffee or you haven't had the right food and, you know, your mouth is talking to you. You know the commercial, the Hanes commercial with the tag? Oh, yeah. I love it. <laughs> or the tag or the stain. Or the stain. Yeah. Oh, it's the best the commercial ever. Stain. You know, it's like you're not, you're, 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 there's something else talking to you and so the distracting. The guy's tried so hard. Yeah. You're in an interview. Focus. And the, ta- and, the, and the stain is going, blah, 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 blah. You I loved it. Focus, yeah, and that, that sometimes that's the same. That does happen, you know. Yeah. Like I know, like if I haven't had my cup of coffee entering into my routine, my stomach is gonna be going, yeah. and then all of a sudden I'm typing. I'm like, wait, no, that's well, not right. Well, it's so much more. I want to say stressful when you're doing a product for someone else, meaning like you can yeah, be yeah. creating your own content. You don't have the weight of a producer or some agency kind yeah, of if you're writing demanding. Speculative. Yeah, if you're writing speculative, you're just doing it. You don't have that weight, but you need to be have that mental strength yeah. to be able to be ready, yes. you know, to even when those squirrel moments happen, it's yeah. like you need to have the ability to discipline dis- exactly so self-discipline so yeah so yeah. the routine will end up slowly breaking apart as you continue becoming b- a better writer yeah the uh, whole world will come against grow. you in exactly. your routine it's almost like the you know like the, the the world is against you the moment that you have your routine it's yeah. like everything that can go wrong will go wrong right. and you have to have that self-discipline yeah. absolutely yeah absolutely but then like there's that fine balance again like if it becomes about if writing becomes about the routine then you've missed the point right you know, yeah. so let's move on to the next topic because we've oh, we've we've so we've established our routine. We know how we're going to begin the process. We we know our 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 writing comfortable space. We've had our cup of coffee or our breakfast or whatever our souffle, whatever it is that that, that we need. You know, we are in our comfy chair, My computers in front of us. What's the first thing though? Because we do things very uniquely, and it's based off of. A lot of research, a lot of school of hard knocks, um, you know, and just kind of trial and error, testing what works and what doesn't work as far as writing, writing style, writing structure, writing technique, writing form and format, all that good stuff. For us, and this isn't a mystery to anyone because anyone that's been following our podcast from the beginning, you all know we're disciplined when it comes to research and infusing research, but not just you know, just the traditional research. And we're going to talk about research on a more nuanced level because sometimes we just say research and we throw that word out there, but yeah. there's so many different types of research right. that we can do. But let's just briefly kind of touch upon, you know, the research process and breaking down the process because this can be one of the most exciting and most tedious step but it can also be one of the more distracting steps too because sometimes people take research as an opportunity to procrastinate and they're like oh i just need to research a little more i'm like no you just need to start writing now and so how to balance that is something that we're going to talk about as well um but from this research you're going to pull ideas you're going to pull out your characters scenes are going to be born um before your writing even begins um and and a wealth it, of motivation. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. And it, it's about finding. It's it's more than just finding facts. There's a there's a depth that you're going to enter into, and an immersion that you're going to enter into as you do research. You're going to place yourself in places, times, in in cultures, in languages that, as you research, are going to be are going to come alive to you, and you'll be able to create true characters as opposed to caricatures, true scenes as opposed to like, you know, broad brush stroke places. That's, it's, it's so, so, so important. And so what are some things, just kind of general, general things that people can do just to immerse themselves in, 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 in different like research and research strategies? What, what are things that people can do? Just, you know, and we're I mean, going to break them down, but like just kind of in general. We know that a lot of filmmakers, when they begin a project, um, they go through the archive of, of films that have been yeah. created um, since the beginning yeah. of Yeah, we do that a lot. We go and, into... And, uh, yeah, because uh, a lot of people, I mean, as Christian says, there's really nothing new under the sun. So, you know, a lot of the stuff that's been created um, has probably been enhanced yeah. in now and today. Yeah. So, you know, you go back and you dig up and you start looking for films um, that are similar or that have the same stories and and you start to learn what they did and how they did it and ways for you not to do it, um, how they were successful and how they failed. Um, That's just 
one little aspect yeah. of just the beginning of your pursuit of research. Right. Well, know? James Lindsay, we interviewed him in um, episode 17, this past episode, and you know he's a, he was a composer for uh, A Blood Throne for us, and he said something that you know actually resonated with us because it was because well in order for us to do a blood throne he brought us on to his research process which married with our research process he took us um to to the museum in new york and which one was it uh uh, Uh, contemporary art i think it was uh mo yes modern art yes 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 yes. um and and he you know he took us to see some like frida kahlo paintings and uh i mean like just kind of all these all these different moments of art history that he was inspired by as he read the screenplay and you know and he kind of just walked us to these paintings and he goes look i want you to look at these colors you know and he and he's talking us through the color and the composition and and i'm like we know about color and composition like this is great study for us but he was thinking about it from a music perspective absolutely and one cool thing i noticed about him and i forgot to mention this on the last podcast is that when he was looking at an artwork I glanced at him and I noticed he at one point wasn't looking at the artwork. He was looking at the people watching the artwork and seeing, and I remember him saying, look at the attention and the aura that this artwork brings. Like, like why, why does it, why are all these people here? And then there's a security guard there uh, beside them. Uh, What is it that it's, it's pulled their attention? Um, and uh, that was very interesting to me because it's so important to when you create a product, when you go back and do your postmortem, being able to watch your audience, hear from your audience, see how they react, see how they experience your project. That goes right back into your research, yeah. how you research, yeah. how are you going to be able to find the things that attract your audience? Yeah. You know, yeah. and so it was uh, yeah, very he, cool. He was looking at um, yeah. Dali's. Um, mm-hmm. I can't remember the name of the the painting, the one with the clock, the wilted clocks. Mm. Um, and he turned and he looked back at all the audience members that like, and it was a pretty pretty packed room. And he was watching the emotion in their faces mm. as they finally came face to face with this painting that's in their history books. You know, right. and he's like, how can I recreate that with sound? Yeah. You know, and, and he was studying that and yeah. he's, you know, and he's taking these notes yeah. and he's like, you know, yeah. collecting this data and, it was, and it he's going to awesome. apply it to his music. Yeah. And then, and then all of a sudden in a blood throne, you know, he comes up with this, okay, we're going to have a male voice, you know, that sings a traditional, you know, Lebanese, uh, you yeah. know, or, or of the era uh, with the vocals like, ah, you know, and he's like, yeah. because I'm going to elicit that same kind of a reaction that I studied and I saw these wilted clocks. Yeah. If I can do that with a wilted voice if I can apply that same kind of feeling I feel and I mean that's that's genius yeah. right yeah absolutely. I mean that's what that is creation that is art that is when you create art where you take and you see something and you recreate it with music in order to elicit a similar response you saw wilted clocks and so you're gonna add a wilted voice mm-hmm. uh, that crescendos and decrescendos in order to get I mean that to me is like yeah. wow and and we were there talking with him about this and dialoguing about it and studying as well and we're like ah yes okay so now when we when if if we shoot this the this angle you know i mean look at how dali painted this he painted it from this angle and not that angle well why if we shoot from this angle while these voices are happening these wilted voices is that going to then marry together to tell the right story and that was all part of research right and it was the moma it was moma like i'm just remembering it now museum of uh, modern uh, art yeah uh so yeah and and for me i know that that um you know art poetry poetry and reading poetry Mm -hmm. um and going into certain poets and kind of uh you know and even if it's just shakespeare and you're reading shakespeare to gain uh moments from his writing genius and how it makes you feel so now you're researching yourself Mm-hmm. You know, you're researching moments of your own emotive experiences with art or poetry, and now you're like, this made me feel this way. How is it that in the sequence of words or in the sequence of sound or in the sequences of visuals, what is it in that that made me feel that way, and how can I recreate it as I build this world, my yeah. world and my story? And that's one of those things where um, you have to be careful, again, to make sure of your squirrel moments because you actually will strip yourself of an emotion that is necessary yeah. for your piece, yeah. for your work. Yeah. So if you're stripping yourself and you're just full of anger based off something that happened, you have stripped yourself of this joy, this peace, this happiness. 
yeah. in your writing when you're trying to write a happy piece, and it shows in your work. Yep, your 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 mood will show in your work. Yeah, and uh, and then people who read it is like, why is this person upset? Why is this person angry? It's like, oh, and and you actually don't have a good reason. You just go back and realize, oh, I actually was upset when I was writing this. Yep. And so yep. it, uh, it's, it's very important. When that happens. Yeah. yeah, it's very important that um, you guard your your and know yourself and what will distract you. Yeah, and you got to write this stuff down. Whether it's like you're taking notes on your phone or you're making giving yourself memos, you know, just to kind of remember these moments mm-hmm. so that you can go back to that headspace. Yeah. And when you're writing, you yes. know, so that you're in that in that world again. And speaking about being in that world. You know, you you need to embed yourself into the world that you're writing. Yeah. You need to put yourself into it. You need to study that world. If you're writing about, uh, you know, uh, here's here's the first example that comes to the top of my mind. Um, Logan, the movie Logan. You know, it's, it's a it's a rated R film. It's a harsh film. Um, you know, there's a lot of violence, but it's it's based on a character and cartoons that I grew up with. I grew up with the X Men. You know, like I grew up watching the cartoons. I grew up reading the comic books. It was just a part of like my my world as a kid, and and so it it, it built a lot of the fantasy that is in my imagination. And well, the Wolverine character, I you know you remember like Jose, he would always be Wolverine whenever we picked. Oh yeah, <laughs> never got always, to be a Wolverine. I never got to pick the Wolverine X Men action figure because he always took it. I always ended up with Cyclops, which left you with Gambit. Yeah. <laughs> I ended up being Gambit. <laughs> Always. Always. But anyway, um, I just I, I think about Logan, and I think how much history there is for that character. That character, I mean, it, it's got a, Marvel owns the intellectual property to that, and you know, and there's a ton of comic book history there. But in order for um, James Mangold to to write Logan, he needed to immerse himself in the world of the Wolverine. He needed to know everything about him. He needed to know what he ate, what he didn't eat, what sets him off, what, what you know, I mean, and everything, why? In order to create truthful reactions, truthful motivations, but more importantly, to know what the character would never do. Right. Yeah. Wouldn't do. Like, yeah. Wolverine would never do that. So don't write that. Don't go there. And the more that you're immersed in the world of this this character, and the more you can be realistic to it, the better the movie. I think sometimes the Wolverine films that are the least successful were the ones that kind of stepped out of the canon of Wolverine. Mm-hmm. And they, and they over-sensationalized. And I think the reason why Logan was so successful I, th- I mean it, it made like 620 million dollars in the box office i think the reason why it was so successful is because it was rooted in the truth of the time in the truth of the character in the yeah. truth of like the story world yeah. and when people watched it they could relate because it was truthful it wasn't something mm-hmm. like crazy outside the box mm-hmm. and and we have to do that in our storytelling Mm-hmm. We have to immerse ourselves in our characters' lives yeah. and know what our character would be motivated by. Yeah. Why they would say yes, why they would say no, why they would go left, why they would go right. Save the girl or save yourself, you know, like, uh, uh, or, or, you know, save, save the city, save the world, or selfishly, you know, do something. It's just, you have to understand the truth of your character and by immersing yourself you can do that with research you can yeah, do absolutely. that with I think studying the genre will pick out, people will pick out um, <clears throat> especially a character they followed all their life you know whether it's you know according to the comics if he is who he is shown to be in the film um, uh, you know but one of the great things um, I actually heard Aaron Sorkin say in his writing is um, you know a lot of times um, it's although it's very important to um, soak in every aspect of the character to you know especially especially when you're doing period pieces especially yeah. when you're doing yeah. um, um, uh, true life uh, you know uh, reenactments yeah, yeah, yeah. Or whatever. You're, you're going well, one back of the into things is and you're he doing says a biopic. is biopic yeah it's 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 important to understand the human condition right um, because when you understand the human condition you're understanding how everyone relates yeah. what people want to see um people want to see people that's what they want to watch they want to watch the human story uh their successes their failures they want to follow the individual and a lot of times uh 
it's actually funny. He doesn't even do. He doesn't even know anything of what he's writing about. He doesn't know anything about uh, Facebook. He doesn't know anything about right. yeah. you know these particular Sometimes projects. Sometimes the, his characters. He says that his characters are smarter than him. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and he makes some extremely intelligent characters. I mean, if you've ever seen like The West Wing, or you or you watch Social Network, yeah. you know, and you're listening to like his characters talk, like, wow, Aaron Sorkin must be a, a genius. Yeah. He's like, no, yeah. I don't know anything about computers. When I wrote, you know. Uh, uh, What's Facebook, his name? The uh, social network? No, no, no. When he wrote uh, Apple. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Steve that's Jobs. Right. That's what he, he like, said. He's yeah. like, I, didn't, I don't know anything. I don't, I'm computer illiterate. And right. yet he writes this. You know, right. Yeah, so. And so one of the things is he, he knows is he knows the human condition. He knows the human being. Um, and that is the key to every story, really. Um, everyone wants to connect. I yeah. think there was a study. And I'm... I'm really messing this up, but um, on where the eyes go when people watch yeah, yeah, yeah. movies at a movie theater and eyes go to eyes. Yeah. And it's just, that's amazing. Eyes go to eyes and rarely will they go to like an explosion in the background or, you know, some person falling or something. But they, <laughs> eyes go to eyes. Yeah, you'll go to the eyes to see the reaction of the explosion. Exactly. Like, yeah. Exactly. And so there's a person wants to connect to people. That's why people interaction i believe that during covid is probably one of the hardest things for people because it's like we want to connect we yeah. want to socialize we want to embrace we want yeah. to have relationships um and um and i think in writing that is key to a successful film is can you have your audience connect with your characters right and it's interesting too because like I'm glad you brought up Aaron Sorkin but then like on the opposite end of the spectrum you've got writers like David Mamet you know who oh, yeah. who says the exact opposite he's right. like he's like yeah, I got to get characters you know yeah. like the story is what's important forget the characters you know yeah. forget the people like why why are you wasting your time and he's really harsh oh, about yeah, it Oh yeah 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 <laughs> but but if you listen to what he's saying He's, he's essentially he's saying that the characters serve the story, you know, like the story don't serve the characters. And like, so if you're, if you're really listening, he's, he's in a way saying the same thing. He's like, look, you want to bring them, you, you want to give them a story, you want to give them this entertainment, you want to bring them on a journey, and, and the characters are the ones that are going to bring you on that journey. And so at the end of the day, you still need to know truthfully is that if a character is you know is making decisions those decisions need to be truthful and need to serve the story right. you know and so in order for you to know that you got to know your character right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely absolutely i think um these are i really think that these are different forms of trying to create a successful story you can either have a movie um, that is um, having you connect passionately yeah. with a character or the story is just so yeah. amazing to you. I can't believe this happened, you know, and you fall. So these are different techniques yeah. of even writing. And, yeah, and, and this, is, didn't, this isn't coming from, the, from a void. We're not making this up. I mean, we had, you know, we had talked about um, uh, A Hero with a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell's really thick, complicated book, talking about, like, the hero's journey and the mythological journey and how it's important for uh, a hero to go through a series of steps and for you to know your hero mm -hmm. and then and then kind of the more watered down version of Joseph Campbell's A Hero um, with a Thousand Faces is um, Vogler's um, uh, A Hero's Journey or Michael Hogg or Hugh I can never Hugh. pronounce his last name correctly okay. um, yeah. you know a, a hero uh, his was um, the, a, her, a, a hero's two journeys you know uh, there are all of these screenwriting gurus are all saying the same thing they're all talking about the importance of the hero and how the, the journey is important but how the hero affects the journey and how the the journey affects the hero and you see the arc of the hero mm -hmm. how he begins and how he apexes and how he ends um you know and, and so all of this is important and for those of you for example that need a little bit more insight and, and want to know okay what is it exactly that i need to research in order to understand the character i would i would suggest that you read those three books read um joseph campbell's a hero with a thousand faces or um i think uh chris chris vogler chris vogler a hero's journey and michael hughes the hero's two journeys those are all great resources look and I'm not gonna say also also ascribe to their story structure because not one person has it perfect even even the godfather of story Robert McKee um, as great as he is and eccentric as he is in his in his story seminars in in, in New York and and and, uh, and in London um, in LA there the He's still there are still pieces that you can take from everyone else and add to that. You yeah, know? and you're so unique as an individual. You've gone through this experience in your life where there's this thing that has been 
given to you within your sphere of influence, uh, you know, um, there's a story that's in you that's going to make you slowly tail off from these structures, yeah. you know, and create your own uh, yeah. that will be able to make you unique. You know, at first you dabble with what's been done. And as you continue getting better, you end up kind of creating and forming yeah. into your own individual. Absolutely. And, there di and there's different types. Of, and so talking about different types of research, right? Excuse me. Um, we talked about reading books. Mm -hmm. Reading books, super important. Yes, yeah. you got to read, read, read books and read books about how to research too. You know, read books, read your screenwriting books because they're going to tell you, you know, where to focus your research to be, but also reading books about the era, about the time, reading books about um, the genre. You know, if you're going to be writing a Western, get into some of Clint Eastwood's, you know, works yeah. and writings. Yeah. Um, um, reading, reading magazines. So if you're doing something that's within, you know, the print era and there are magazines of the time, you know, like there's, uh, uh, for example, Teen magazine will always be connected to the 90s. Like, I'm sorry. Like, if you go, if you want to make a movie about the 90s, read Teen magazine because you're going to get an understanding of, like, what, like, of that culture based on the, you know, like, and I, I'm, I know that that magazine is still in circulation, but it was like, I feel, I personally feel like it's, it was at its height back when I was in, you know, back when I was in high school because mm -hmm. it's like everyone was reading it. You know, like, even guys were reading it. And I'm like, what is this? But, you know, getting into periodicals of the time, whether it's newspapers um, or remember when we were doing underground and we found actual cutouts and postages from the era of abolitionists and police and when the Fugitive Slave Act and the Fugitive Slave um, Law was passed in, in 1851, we found a series of postages that were posted all through Boston. And they were original copies. Remember, we found uh, some archives, and it was like uh, it was warning slaves that there were slave hunters in the city, and the posters were put everywhere. And we we actually, when we found that, we used it as research to talk to find out oh where are these actually typically posted, why are they posted, who posts them, but also what is written on it. And then after we researched it, we took the image and used it in the film. It appears yeah. in that closing scene when, you know, when Bull, Chase, and Hawthorne are, are walking up to the fallen uh, sailor that they've just shot. And if you look on the wall, on the shops that we all, that are completely CGI, him VFX did a phenomenal job with this. They, they posted and they used that research, not just as research for the writing, but as research that actually appeared in the right. film. right. Which right. is pretty cool. Right. It's yeah. pretty cool. It's just, it's, it's kind of like a pat in the back. Like, hey, we did some pretty good research I think, there. I think um, a lot of time research gets a bad rap um, because it's research. Yeah. And, you know, and you think about like high school and your teacher telling you to do research. But one of the coolest things, if you can see research this way, I remember when we went on field trips, you know, and yeah. we got onto the bus and all the kids got on the bus yes. and we're traveling in the ride and we're going to the aquarium or we're going to the zoo, we're going to somewhere. That was so much fun. But yes. guess what the teacher was doing? We were researching, we were going hands on, we were yeah. experiencing the environment so that we would go back and we did our essays or we wrote our books. That was a blast. So yeah. technically, if you really think about it, research is probably the best part. It's before it's before the storm, really. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. before it's you're the, actually it's the calm. Before yeah, the storm. yeah, it is. It's like you're enjoying everything before you end up going into this into the fray. Into, into the fray. Yeah. 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 So you're going on field trips, doing reading books, watching movies, you yeah. know, uh, finding pictures, taking pictures. Um, so it's actually really fun research. Yeah. And that and that research and, and that research is, is is connected even to your the experience research, which is right. something that we talked about. You know, um, we had a you know we had a trip that we were booking for Israel to go and experience Israel because we were writing a biblical epic, and. You know, we talked a lot about that, and we talked about the experience. It's like, sure, you can write about Israel. Sure, you can write about these ancient places. Sure, you can write about spiritually how the, the, the like, what these places mean. But imagine being before Mount Moriah. Yeah. Imagine, you know, being in Gethsemane. And now you're sitting there, and you're in this place that has been written about for the last, you know, 6,000 years. And you're there, and you're taking it in, and you're experiencing. Is that not going to affect your writing? Well, I mean, I think about this. I think about uh, what was the movie done by Shane Hurlbut, Navy SEAL movie? 
Uh, I'm blanking out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Off the top um, of my head. Something six. Uh, team. Uh, Seal Team Six. Possibly. I, I think. I think it might be called something else. But yeah. Regardless. But he did the. He did. Yeah, because there were two that came out at the same. All exact the actors time. were Navy Seals. Now, Real Navy Seals. Why That's did right. that? Why was that movie successful? There were no. There weren't really actors. There weren't like professional actors. But Clint Eastwood did that too. Yeah. He just recently did that with um the. All right, go ahead. You keep going. It'll come to mind. Yeah. Go ahead. We're forgetting so, titles here. My, 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 my point being is that you can still have something successful with just pure research. People that, are, that know the field, that have experienced it. The, no one really knows what it is to have boots on, a gr- on the ground when there's a war except for that soldier. Yeah. And if that soldier were to write, to perform, or show the world what it feels like, the audience will feel it. Yeah. They'll know that's that that person's real. That yeah. person went through it. That person experienced this, and I there's no shadow of a doubt because I just felt just a glimpse. I can't imagine yeah. what it would be if I was yeah. on the field. And Shane Holbert was the was the DP right yeah. um, for Act of Valor. Yeah, Act of Valor. There you go. Yeah. yeah, and so you think about it like I love that movie. I thought it was awesome. The the techniques, the movement. They were moving so perfectly. Like they're they're like I knew these guys were the real deal. Yeah. Like compared to the movies where you have cool movements and stuff, but it wasn't procedure. You know, it wasn't like the correct yeah. operation yeah. format. And you knew that you were watching. It was almost like if it was real live footage of yeah. them going in and doing an, uh, an operation. Yeah. No. I mean. That comes from that you know comes- using source, using actors that know, which is in a sense in comparison to research. If you have the research that is true, that is real, you know you can go into it showing the audience the real, the truth, versus you just kind of writing it off of just how you feel and how you desire, what you want to see, but more so actually taking the time yeah. to figure out what's real. Yeah, no, and, and, and the research is important. And you see that a lot too, like in films where, you know, you may be an expert in a specific field and then the movie is showing that field and you're like, that's not how they do it. Yeah. You know, like, you know, you're watching, you know, I was talking, actually, I was talking to my brother-in-law who's his job requires him to be inside operating rooms and he watches all of these surgeries and you know he's like it's terrifying it's it's horrendous and i go yeah just like gray's anatomy goes no you can't mean gray's anatomy that like talking on the phone hanging over a body you know like he's like it's nothing like that you know and like research um leads you to create this real these real moments that immerse you into it Uh, absolutely it all depends on how you want to tell the story too right so it's like You know, do you want them to just be entertained by these characters, these right, actors? Right, because it's Sorkin's is the most right? successful, exactly. you know, medical drama, and and, and right. do it doesn't matter because they're the human. Or do you want them to believe that they're really in yeah, this procedure? You're right. You're right. And There's a purpose you, to all of right, it. Exactly. And you so. gotta. And you got. But here's the thing: you are the writers of Grey's are going into that knowing what they're doing. Right. They're not like, oops, I made a mistake. I didn't know you couldn't do that. No, they're mm-hmm. making choices, yeah. conscious choices, because they want to entertain you with the lives of these people. Yeah. And they're not so much concerned about the fact that, you know, well, the proper way of washing your hand is like this, 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 and that. It's like, no, 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 yeah. no. Don't get distracted by that. Whereas if the, if the show decided to go in that route, it's a conscious choice also mm-hmm. that they're going to make to go in that route. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and the yeah. research leads to that. Another, another kind of uh, research that we talk about is, um, you know, firsthand and secondhand experiences. So, like, interviewing firsthand experiences, people that are survivors of that era. So, mm-hmm. like, for example, if you're doing something, you're doing a story about, I don't know, you, you, you're going to do a story about JFK or something yeah, like that. Yeah, well, or, there's a really good example, um, Christopher Nolan's recent movie um, with, um, there was a war movie that Dunkirk? he just did. Dunkirk. You know, the research, the extensive research that he did and interviewing yeah. the veterans, yeah. that the veterans came back to the movie and they were leaving there bawling their eyes out. Yeah, the same thing happened with uh, with uh, Spielberg's, uh, the, the opening scene there with Tom Hanks. Oh, uh, yes. yes. One yes. of the most... D-Day, yes. Yeah, one um, of the most graphic yeah. but realistic as far as sounds and sights yeah. of, you know, the, that, that moment where they're storming yeah. Normandy and they're coming yeah. out of the boats and they're getting mowed down. Yeah. Like yeah, that, that, that stuff. Yeah. yeah, you could have just you didn't. I mean, they, it was so much detail in that um, because they wanted to make people experience in that. You just got dropped off 
in the front of the shorelines of the firefight. Yeah. As a viewer. Yeah. You got dropped off. Yeah. And that's what they wanted. You literally to do. just they threw you there. And yeah. You're like, ah! It was it was <laughs> like, so intense. It yeah. was so intense. But like when the soldiers, the veterans left and they're crying, they're like, that's exactly what happened. That is exactly it. You just took me back. And it was actually healing for them because it was something that's been there kind of that's been yeah, eating Inside. at them and yeah, remembering these things, remembering these things. Now they were, able to, they were able to share it with everybody. Yeah. They were like, yes, now everyone can see what we went through. Yeah. And they have some sort of release and some sort of freedom of being like, now now everyone understands and they can be f- freed yeah. from feeling as though they were alone. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's interesting, too, because like, that's the power of story, huh? Mm-hmm. It, you know, it gives a voice to the voiceless sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of those soldiers have held that in, not to wanting to talk about the war. And now, like, they've purged. They've had their catharsis. It's come out. And they're like, they can almost, like, move past that now. Mm-hmm. Like, you all see it. You've seen it. You've experienced it. You know, and we're all now in, a, in, a, in an agreement, kind of in the same place. We've had a dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. And well, there's been a kind of a healing now. there. Yeah, exactly. Some sort of, they can, they feel like they can connect now in, in a sort of sense, yeah. you know, that they have, they're not alone in this world where it was years ago, but now they was being able to. Yeah, but I, I guarantee, you know, that like, for example, in order to write some of these things, like, it would have been good to stand at that beach, you know, before you're about to write and just kind of walk around and experience that. And I'm not saying that, like, okay, now you got, as a writer, you got to go bankrupt because you got to fly all over the world. No, but. If you got the money. But if you've got the means, you've got the opportunity and it's something that's within reach, that's something within your means, yeah. like, that's something that you can do, do yeah. it. Yeah. Do it. If it means travel, travel. If it's a drive, it's a short drive, drive. It's an interview, call up somebody. Call up yeah. that person. You know, if you're making a military film, like, call someone, you know. Right. You'd be surprised yeah. how willing yeah. people are to just share yeah. their stories. Everyone wants to talk about themselves. Yeah, you can never Everyone. have... Uh, you can never have not not enough yeah. research. You know, we, I remember we, we have a... For the last film we did, which was a short for... 40-minute short... We have 400-page book research on yeah, it, you know? More than that. And, yeah, uh, and, more it's, than that. and it's extensive. We, we wrote 400 yeah. pages worth of, of research like, just on re- this 40-minute yeah. short. We published that. <laughs> I, I, I think, I think could be we a history should. Book. I mean, it was available to our crew, to our, crew, to our yeah. actors, for them to be like, whoa, this is who you want me to be. This is questionnaires upon questionnaires and research. It was just like so. Yeah. And, but it was so good because the moment I put my hands on that keyboard to start writing scenes or start writing beats and all this stuff it was boom 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 just quick it was it was just so easy because i knew the characters i knew yeah. the story I knew so awesome transition yeah you've got all of this information now you are immersed in the world you've you know your characters routine. you've got your research you've got your routine I got my sour patch kids in my you've belly. got your sour patch kits your skittles yeah. and your coffee yeah and maybe a uh, bacon egg and cheese Ooh. from some awesome place, Crave. Doesn't matter. We, wow. Yeah. You just shouted out Crave. I did. I gave Crave a shout out. Uh, just random aside, for those of you that live in the North Shore, go to Peabody, check out Crave. Beverly, Beverly. Ah, uh, Beverly. Yeah. You go to Beverly, check out Crave. Phenomenal breakfast sandwiches. That's going to be part of our routine now. It's like just, a just random shout breakfast out. sandwich. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, but you know what? That's how we're going to start it. All right. No. Um, but yeah, you've got your routine. Mm-hmm. You've got your research. You're ready to go. And what do we do? The very first thing now, because the, and, and it doesn't belong to us. This isn't something that we do. You know, when we go we have, buy these three we have by five a, a more index cards. version of it. Yeah. In our, because you and I, we just we we think alike, and yet we wanted to, you know, find ways to get more detailed. But I think what we begin to do is we start writing beats, right? Start writing little scenes here yeah. and there on cards, on computer, whatever yep. it is. Um, on your phone, on a Google Doc, whatever helps you so that um, you can remember and have it down, whether yeah. it's a terrible idea, yeah. whether, you know, it's, you know, and, um, you know, this idea that just may not work with your story, still write it down yeah. because you'll find yourself, there's a reason why you even thought of it. Yeah. Um, it isn't until you've got your best that you can start taking out, you know. Yeah, and I and I think that that's and and, and that, there's a process with that though. Yeah. You know, like okay, so what we do, <clears throat> we we buy three by five index cards, and we've got a pretty. Uh, I think it's like a three, 
uh, three feet by no, or five feet by six feet or something. I, I, there's a, a cork different board. kinds, different kind of size cork, cork board. board yeah. What I'll do is one. I'll put this actual sizes on on the uh, uh, on the show notes because the, it's it, it actually the size does correlate to the amount of scenes that we create. Each cork board, if we use three by five index cards, gives us somewhere depending on how we arrange it, forty to seventy index cards. Now McKee says forty to sixty is ideal when you're writing scenes. Um, others will say you know. 50 to 70. It mm-hmm. just depends on kind of like the type of writer that you are. For example, Sorkin, he writes eternal amount of pages, but that's because he's just got a ton of dialogue. But dialogue can be performed really quickly, and so he may have like a 200 page script, but it's going to translate into a two hour movie, not because it's too, it, you know. 200 pages equals two hours. No, it's just it's a ton of dialogue. It's a ton, you know, that he's writing. And so, like, you may have more cards because of that. Mm -hmm. And so we feel comfortable more on the higher side. We do 70, um, 60 to 70, and that usually yields for us about a 120-minute film. Okay, so what we do is we take three by five index cards and on each index card, we will write our title. So we'll say interior, exterior, or IE, interior, exterior, whichever it is, we'll give the what we think is going to be the location of the scene. It changes. Yeah. It changes. But where we think, let's say wilderness, sure. okay, day or night. Boom, that's at the very top, that little thick area of the index card, we write the title. Then underneath we go and we write either story beats or scene ideas. We'll give a general concept of the idea, general concept of where that scene begins, the middle of it, and the end. Maybe we'll write, you know, like and highlight a, a line of dialogue perhaps that inspires us. But the idea is we're saying, for example, underground. Uh, you know, Margaret enters and catches Dr. Thomas, you know, uh, creating a, uh, a hole. And that's the scene. That's the card. And we write it down. Margaret enters, catches yeah, Dr. Thomas. Yeah, not worrying about dialogue. Not worrying about anything. We're just giving it. Exactly. Not worrying about uh, other amenities. This is, this is what you want to see in the right. sense. This is the interaction. Right. This we're not the- talking about composition, angles, colors, nothing. It's just kind of giving an idea so that we know the general flow of story. Because this is all the setup. This is all the cracked story. Okay, we've gone past our research. We know our characters. We know what they would do, what they won't do, what they will say, what they won't say, and why. And now we're taking these cards and we are giving ourselves general moments of where we want to begin. Where's the middle and where's the end? And oftentimes we begin that way. We don't necessarily all of a sudden know our story. It doesn't like miraculously deposit. For some it does. Yeah. Sometimes, Sometimes we've had that. I know the ending and then yeah. you work your way to the ending. Right. You work backwards from the ending. Right. And so you begin with an idea. Something that like inspired you to tell the story in the first place. Maybe it is the ending. Maybe you've got the perfect ending and you go, okay, here's the ending. Ending, and now I've got to kind of work my way backwards from that. And what you do is you can create islands. Mm-hmm. You know, if you understand story and you understand structure, then you know, for example, at every point there's an inciting incident, mm-hmm. right? You know that there's a beginning, and and then you know that there's a you know that there's kind of a, 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 a an aftermath of the entire story once you've come down from that denouement. And so. You've got these islands. You've got these turning points that go from, from act to act to mm-hmm. act. And, and, and you've got, you know, kind of zenith uh, moments at each point. And so you, you, you mark out these cards and you write out these moments that you kind of are inspired by as a result of having done research and knowing a general understanding of how you, you want to work this story. And you put them on. And so now you've got a row of eight. Boom, 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 boom. And you've got your first act. You've got your second act. Setup. And you've got your third act. Mm-hmm. Now, <clears throat> having said that, talking about story structure, and this is something that we're going to get into a little bit more at next week's uh, mm-hmm. uh, podcast. There is no specific, we personally don't necessarily work in just three acts. It depends on the story that we're trying to tell. It also depends on the platform. You know, TV obviously traditionally is in four, film traditionally as a result of Aristotle's um, poetics is in three, but you can, you know, Shakespeare wrote in five. Um, you know, certain people have, you know, right in seven, um, you know, if you read into the woods, for example, um, that, that book is all about, you know, uh, about five acts story structure. And so sometimes we'll write in three, sometimes we'll write in four, sometimes we'll write in five, sometimes we've written in seven. Um, it just depends on the story that we're trying to tell. It depends on the turning points. It depends on the hero. It depends on the journey. There's so much that it depends on. So having said that, we're not, we're not, if we give a specific act structure is because that's the act structure that we gave that we use for a specific movie so right now let's talk about let's use weight in the water we're working on weight in the water 
Wait in the Water is going to be a television series where right now we just finished the pilot. We're starting episode one and we're going to be writing about, it's going to be a limited series. We're going to write about eight or so episodes. Um, and the episodes are going to begin in the early 1850s and they're going to work their way through the 50s and they're going to lead into the Civil War. So now we understand kind of a general gist of of each episode and where more or less historically we're going to space them out in order to get to the Civil War. First episode, pilot episode, we want to introduce the characters. We want everybody to understand the world. We want to know what their motivations are. We want to know why these characters do what they do. And so we have to then create cards that answer these very important quest character questions because otherwise the, no one's going to watch this and hang with us throughout the duration of it. They don't understand why these characters even exist. So we come up with the cards. Now, for those of you that want a little bit deeper of a breakdown of how the card and card structure works, there's a really cool video on YouTube by Dustin, Dustin, Dustin Lance Black. Mm -hmm. um, I believe he, he wrote Milk and won an Academy Award for it. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I can I could double check that, but I mean he's 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 pretty prolific screenwriter, and if you YouTube his name and you YouTube um, card story structure, his video pops up and it's a really good informative video about the process. I would I would encourage you to check that out because you're gonna get some great inside tips about it. Nevertheless. Um, once we've done that, we now know, and it's filled out and we're looking at it, now we know more or less where's the story going. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily the screenplay, no. and it may not even follow that order, no. but we've got a great bone skeleton. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We know, we have an idea of um, where our character's desire is, it starts to be, be formed, we start to know um, like uh, the 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 you know, the climax, the things that we want to end with, we start to know kind of uh, a good, good, like you said, bone, bone structure to be able to start piecing, start, yeah. start, start putting all the things together. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that's not, it's not the muscles, it's not the tendons, it's no. not the ligaments no. of this body, it's not the skin, it's not, it's not even the makeup at the end and none of that. All you've got is bones. Yeah. You've got bones. Yeah. And on these bones, you're going to add all of the flesh. Yeah. And what's great about this is that now you know, okay, this is what this, this story looks like. You know, you've got the anatomy of it laid out, and now you know, okay, I, I want to give it a little bit more of a belly. You know, mm -hmm. I want to make it a little bit more pudgy, or, or, or I want to I wanna make it a little right. bit stronger, yeah. you know. And, and now when you're going into the writing, you're able to make those creative choices because as you, as you begin to write, things shift, things mm -hmm. mold. Characters lead you to places that you didn't think you were going to go. Yeah, yeah, you definitely don't want to start the writing process without this because the moment that you do, you, the moment that you put... Uh, you know, words on paper as a script, you are emotionally attached to that. And it is hard to delete what you've written. Yeah. Um, so it is best to start super simple, even if it's yeah. tedious. Yeah. Um, it's going to become a stronger story um, where, before you go on to the script. And the cool thing about, for example, beginning with note cards is that they're just note cards. You're going to write about 300, 200, maybe 100, you know, you're going to write a ton. And you're going to have to kill your darlings. That's right. Check out episode 15, 16, uh, 14, 15, and 16 yes. on darlings. Yes. Because that's actually, that's a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big deal. And it's at that point where it's the best time for you to kill your darlings because you're the least attached to it. The moment that it just, it's on that document and you're just like, oh, it's in there now. It's so good. It's so good. But it... But it's good. nothing to do with your story. Yeah, exactly. It's awesome. <laughs> right. And so um, that's why we do that process. Yeah, yeah. But why else is that process really great for us is because we're collaborating. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. We're collaborating. When you're collaborating, um, it, it is, it, I mean, it's a blessing that we're brothers because we've grown up together. So we kind of know how we think. Yeah. But when you're time. working with other people, the best thing to have is that oneness. And when it's all on paper, it's out of your brain and you can all look at it and yeah, you may formulate different ideas based on what it says, but it's very, it's not so broad yeah. where you're not too far away from the story. It's actually probably going to be a good idea where you guys can balance, you know, work with each other. So it's actually really good to have a room of writers and to start to formulate ideas on what's going to be the best thing for the story. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what's great? <clears throat> 
now that you've come into agreement with one another and you've got, you know, like the room agrees, this is the story. Then you can, then you can have one person write and then, you know, the other writers then, you know, like kind of like setting up a writing's room, a writer's room, you know, oftentimes, yes, you'll send people on writing assignments and other people will be writing scenes and things to try and break story and then it gets brought together. But there's always a lead in that. You, you always need an appointed individual that kind of brings it together, whether it's a showrunner in TV or the screenwriter or the director in film. Um, for, for us, just because of the way that our brains work, right, we're breaking this story together and I'll, you know, I'll either take it or you'll take it and then we're giving each other notes in order to kind of uh, synthesize the story. But what ends up happening is because we've done all of this research, we now, as we're writing, are not only writing truthfully, but we're researching ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And that sounds weird. So what do I mean by that? There are three forms of research that we do when we're writing. Mm -hmm. When once we've already done all of the analytical stuff, there's the research of, uh, of um, our imagination, there's the research of our memory, and there's the research of fact. Yeah. And McKee is really big about this. He talks about this, Robert McKee. But for the way that this breaks down for me personally and for, and for Jonathan, the way that we break this down is, for example, with imagination, you have to, you've now got all this stuff in your brain and it's okay now to let it go because it's all muscle memory, right? Like you've, you've got all these facts and all of these information, all this research and all this stuff that you've gone through and done 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 and now it's ingrained and ingrained and ingrained and you're almost like an expert in that topic. And so now you can set it aside and let your imagination go free. And your imagination now is kind of unhinging itself from the restrictions of the facts and coming up with outside the box ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, ideas can come from. As you're writing, now you're no longer bound to the facts. You just set that aside, kind of like an actor. You know, and I think in one of our episodes, when we do the actor's roundtable discussion, um, Tommy, Tommy Grauer, talks about his process that he does all this research and then when he's on set, he, lets, he forgets it all and he just reacts and he lets his imagination go free. He listens to the actor that's in front of him and he responds truthfully as his imagination is going. And it's the same thing for the writer. Yeah, absolutely. You let go of all that research mm -hmm. and you just allow yourself to be creative mm -hmm. in the moment yeah. and imaginative and trust that the processes that you set up a routine that you did all of the work in order to be immersed in your story so that when you're allowing your imagination to sneak into your writing mm -hmm. it's truthful yeah and along with that i mean that's almost just a form of a, a method acting in a form in a sense for him and, and even in in writing it's the, the method the, writing yeah you just coined something wow <laughs> uh you know and 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 I'll, another thing too is imagination i think that's a great great thing to ask how yeah. can you have an imagination like what how do you just think of something out of the blue um a lot of times and this is something that i learned in in, in school in, in graphic design is a lot of times the art or the imagination or the idea is within your product within your source within your world of what you're creating so for instance i'll give you an example um if i look at um this background here and you see the black the white a little bit of green the white table um you start to think how am i going to put text on this so that it looks nice well you have to look at the environment of what's inside uh of this of the video um you know you have a silver you know that is very secondary color versus a primary being like a white or a black you have to bring out a color that is within your environment i'm not going to bring like uh, some purple hot pink or some hot pink in the environment if it doesn't work inside your world you start thinking, well i can do a white text because it's in my world i can do silver text because it's in my world i can do black text because it's in my world i can do blue text because it's in my world i can so that's how you start to envision in your imagination because it's you in my world exactly because it's in my world and i'm trying to give you a visual of understanding of imagination a lot of times when you're writing these scenes it's dangerous to go outside your world your world is your best friend for ideas and if you start to say you know um for instance, uh, in Underground, you know, uh, Thomas is creating a hole and Margaret is coming in um, and the hole goes um, to uh, some sort of, um, I don't know, 
a grave. You know what I mean? Like that. No, that has nothing to do with the right, story. With the story, the story, it, it, the hole can go down into a hidden railroad. You know what I mean? And 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 then you start, you know, formulating yeah. it because it's relating to your I to your you. world. And so you. that's kind of the idea. That's where you start thinking of. You're building your, parameters based on exactly what you've already researched is the part of that exactly. world. Exactly. That that is your that is your help. You yeah. know, and so when you start thinking, have an imagination, sit back, think about all the knowledge. And then when you're going into there, it's there for you. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you don't have to you don't have to just go back and start, you know, doing all this research again. Your world will help you. Yeah, you know? it's already there. Exactly. It's already there for you. You've done the research. You've got to trust the process. You've yeah. got to trust what you've done. You just have to sometimes kind of take step back, kind of be kind with yourself, give yourself mm -hmm. a moment. Maybe you need to step out of your routine for a minute and do something completely different to jargle, you know, like kind of disrupt the mind and disrupt yeah. the flow because maybe you're too in yeah. it and to pull yourself out so that you can go back in and see it with objective eyes. Right. And one of the things that we've done in the past is when we were like, we, wow, what are we going to do here? What, what, what scene are we going to do here? So we said, all right, let's get a group of actors. Let's improvise it. Yeah. And a lot of times during these improvisations, you know, they know the world and it just comes out of them. And you're like, that's what we're going to do for the yeah. scene because yeah. it <clears throat> answered that, you know, got us over the hump. It, yeah. You know, created that bridge to yeah. get over. I like that. I like the idea of the parameters. Like, don't fall, you know, like there are circles here, right? So you can work in circles. Yeah. These are the colors. Work in those colors. Exactly. This is a part of the world. This, these are the parameters. Exactly. These are the limitations. What's that saying? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention, right. right? And so, like, this is it. You can't go outside of it. There's a need. So you're going to invent something based on what's here. And you're going to create something that's beautiful, but make it so that it's within these parameters and it's going to be brilliant. Yeah. It's already here. Don't try and go outside of right. it and bring in pink into here. Or don't go and go outside of it and bring triangles because there's no triangles in this world. Right, right. You've done your research. Stick to the world. Trust it. And you're going to yeah. find as of, as, because the necessity is there, yeah. you're going to create and invent something that's beautiful. Right. It's, that's really like metaphorical language, no, but, but it, I, I get it. But I, yeah, I mean, you, you start to question, you know, you have to, when you create that world, you have to know why you created the world that you did too. Because for instance, when you see all these curves, you know, you see all these circles, they mean something, yeah. you know, they have, they, a, a, they give right. a feeling out, yeah. you know, when you have these hard shapes, they're strong, they're aggressive. When you have these circles, you start to think very gentle, very calm, yeah. very soothing, very smooth, almost feminine type, you know yeah. what I mean? Because it's, it's, it's important to be uh, welcoming and not harsh, you know what I mean? And yeah. so these are the things, these are the, I mean, everything is done for a reason. Yeah. So you have to, when you create that world, when you created your bones, you know, you build on the bones. You don't build on something else. Right. So that's right. the idea is, right. you know, you have to be able to create within your world. Yes. So that's imagination. So you've allowed your imagination to kind of roam free, but not, not outside your world. It's free in your world because mm -hmm. you've done your research. The next thing is um, memory. Memory. And what that means is, you know, the, the saying, um, like, write what you know. Um, you you. It's not that you're necessarily going to be writing only what you specifically know, because like as you've done research, you've grown to know new things. But I think this goes hand in hand with what we just talked about. Like, don't go outside of what you know and what you've researched. Like, maintain and stay within the memories, you know, mm -hmm. because you, first and foremost, these are your like. Let's say you're going off of your personal memories, right? Let's say you're going off your personal memories and you're writing and you've had, you had this one experience. And again, this goes back to even like method acting or, uh, or Stella Adler's technique in acting, you know, like sense memory. You're going back to moments that you have had in your own past that have created for some emotive experience some sort of emotional re, you know, result of something, right? Uh, and, and, you're, and you're performing based off of that. And so the scene... The scene is like, okay, your son has died, but but you're not you're you're, you're not a parent, so mm -hmm. you, and you don't have a son, right? But you're an actor, and you have to act this out. Well, what do you do? You know, it's like, oh well, my cat. 
died last year and that really broke my heart you know like that really i mean it moved me to tears because mm -hmm. my cat was my best friend and so like you use that sense memory right. in your performance right yeah that's similar to in your writing like you can use that memory you can use sense memory absolutely um in your writing process go ahead yeah and and it's so important because it goes back again to the human condition everyone will experience something very similar we relate because we all experience the same thing so for instance uh, there's a great commercial, and, and I'm going to do it with you, and you can tell me. Uh, we haven't rehearsed this. Okay, so, here we go. Um, so when I do this, so when I do this, what's the first thing that you think of? Yeah. There's two things. Tell, me, tell me the first one that came to your mind. Okay. Well, uh, Matthew McConaughey rolling a booger while he's doing a Cadillac commercial. You got it. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's not a booger, but it's he's not. Doing, he's, he's just like, doing this right, thing. All right. I don't know. You what know, he's, he's doing. rolling his finger, and the comedian. <laughs> That's actually really funny. And the comedians made it. Like, I don't want to say rolling, it. it was talk. Ta um, no, who am I saying? Who it? Uh, Jim Carrey, I think, did a spoof on it on yeah, SNL, right. where he's like. I don't know when I'm going to let go of this booger or something like that, you know, <laughs> but, it, but it's hysterical because everyone knows we're humans where we are all the same. Why did he think of a booger? Because it's real. That's that's just a human condition. Some that's how some people do it. And it's it, and made people laugh because it's real. And I want to prove your point. Go ahead. We did not. We did not. He did not rehearse me. He did not prompt me on all that. He just literally just did it, and it literally came to mind. It I was gave thinking, you an image. Yeah, right away. I was thinking of two things. I was like, r money, talking about money. But then as yeah. I saw him as going I, in I weird went from circles, this to this, <laughs> yeah. that's what I was like. No, nah, that that's he's rolling a booger, and that's yeah. Matthew McConaughey. And so that's that's my <laughs> point. Is there's memory, things your experiences yeah. can relate with others, and it's okay to bring your memory, things yeah. that have happened in your past, because yeah. you have. To. That's how you can relate. That's you how you can to. write stories that can relate with people. you have to because if you're if you're pulling from personal situations you know because personal by the way, moments I don't, I don't roll my boogers like that just want to let you know <laughs> Just no comment. No comment. Uh, I've, I've no seen, comments on the bottom, I've seen please. how you roll your boogers. Yes. All right. Uh, <laughs> no. So, uh, I'm so thrown right now. Okay. Memory. This one's unique. Yeah. Memory. So, no, it's important. It's so important for you to rely upon real moments that you've had because you're going to apply that into your writing. Whether, you know, it's dynamic moments, emotive moments, realistic moments. Um, there's, there's a quote that we wrote down. Um, Charlie Kaufman says, um, when I write characters and situations and relationships mm -hmm. I try to sort of utilize what I know about the world limited as it is and what I hear from my friends and see with my relatives and he's talking about from that place mm -hmm. of writing what he knows you know yeah. so it's like he's he's not trying to pretend to ex to know an emotion you know he's writing from a place that you know he has experienced and you know and, and sometimes that's why some of the most you know some of the best writers are some of the most interesting and eccentric you know have lived some unique and interesting lives um and special um, in certain ways because they're, they're pulling from these places, you know, like, oh, well, when I was a kid, I didn't go on the soccer field and play baseball or play football with all the other kids. I, I was, you know, I was doing this because I had asthma and, you know, and I was writing and I was looking at the world from a different lens, you know, like yeah. you get those stories a lot. Um, but then you also get the, you know, the, the other the other side of it, you know, like, well, I, I was the athlete, I was this, but like, this is what was going on in my home, you know, mm -hmm. and these are the tragedies that were happening and I'm pulling you know and you're pulling from this this these memories and mm -hmm. that's another form of research and again and if you've done your your analytical research prior to this you're going to that those two are going to marry yeah they're going to marry because again talking about Wade in the water we're talking 1850s the series that we're about to that we're writing right now the pilot episode I have I don't know what it's like to live the life of a slave, a black slave in 1850s America. And so I can't, I can't tell you what those feelings are, but I have personal feelings that we're not gonna go into right now that I've experienced, you know, growing up as a child that I could say these moments resonate, these moments are real, these moments I have been, you know, either whether it's subjugated or, or you know, felt shackled and bonded by something or whatever and you would start to apply though those memories to these characters and they then become real mm -hmm. they become real yeah absolutely so, and you know I, I i i don't want to stay on this one too long but you have to think about like even quentin tarantino he wrote this piece you know this uh, uh django unchained um you know you ask well he didn't experience he was not a slave but he wrote it in a memory where he wrote it from a from a world that he knew 
Yeah. You know, uh, he he wanted to create a hero. He wanted to give back. Yeah. You know, yeah, in, that's in a that theme form. in a lot of his films. And, exactly. And uh, in uh, Glorious Bastards, the same yeah. exact way. Wanted same to thing. give back yeah. um, some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of, you know. Retribution. retribution. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so whether I, whether right or wrong, it's it's just part of his his desire but, but and what he wants to exactly, do with film. That, exactly. And so that, that that's his way of being able to go into a and genre. He's effective. Yeah, go into a genre that for some may be like, whoa, be careful. But he is doing it in a way of a memory of like this is how I felt when I see these videos this is what I want to do with it yeah. hands down and the final research that you do is the factual one which is what we've already talked about but that doesn't end that does continue mm -hmm. you know and I and there's the fact, factual research that you do prior to beginning the writing process and then there's the factual research that you do throughout it because Things are going to pop up. No matter how much of an expert you think you are about the Fugitive Slave Act, there's still going to be some court case somewhere in some random part of like Kansas somewhere that is, is relevant and you're going to need to research it and you didn't do that research prior because it just never came up and you just need to be open throughout the writing process to continue being Berean, right? about studying and using a, a biblical term you know um the bereans were people that were considered studious and that they didn't just take anyone's word for it they went back and they studied it and made sure that they themselves had the truth of what you know of the word um you have to be berean yeah. you have to be berean about it throughout the process throughout the writing process and be diligent about the work yeah. because it's a, you know because it the characters are going to take it in places that you didn't expect yeah. the story is going to go you've got your cards but that's not necessarily how it's going to end up even right now with with uh you know with wade in the water you know we thought that our cards were going to take us immediately into new bedford but we're like oh no we got to go through the wilderness before we get and we see 18 1950s, you know, New Bedford oceanfront waterside, like those great schooner ships and all that. So, like, we were really excited about that. And in the cards, that came up sooner. But the character took us in a different, more dynamic direction. And we're mm -hmm. like, we know we got to follow the protagonist. Yeah. We got to follow him through the wilderness and see how he confronts the Cherokee Indians and, you know, and, and himself being a black man and the Cherokees having slaves and like that confrontation and that fight and that all out, you know. And by the 1850s, these, you know, Indians had, mu they had their, their, revolvers and they had their muskets and so it's different it's not bow and arrow you know and so like all that research then comes together mm -hmm. with the truth of the moment with your continued factual research and it just it becomes fun mm -hmm. becomes fun okay now finally um you've got your note cards you've got you've got your your uh let's see uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. talking about collaboration just ultimately We'll, we'll, we'll close with this before we go into our creator's tip of the week um, because we've, we've done a lot more talking about the research part. The cool thing about collaborate, um, you know, about doing all of this and, and taking research in these three formats is that when you're working in a group, in a team, you're working yeah. like you and I, you said it best, like we're kind of blessed in that we're brothers and we can finish each other's sentences and it makes it easy for our writing, but that may not be the same situation across the board. It might be a producer working with a writer. It might be two writers working together. Um, you know, it might be a director that's working with a writer and they're not related uh, or whatever. It could be a writing room set up. Um, when this research is done and it's done together, there's like a synergy and a unity that happens that creates for creativity mm -hmm. and it emboldens and it kind of builds a momentum with creativity and it actually helps the process. Mm -hmm. There is the danger of using research as an excuse to procrastinate, but that's why working in teams, you're able to kind of like keep each other in check and say, hey yeah. bro, yeah. We, gotta, we gotta move on to the next yeah. phase. We gotta we gotta move forward, mm -hmm. and that's and that's and I, I I we encourage that we encourage working, and I know that um, oftentimes like you know write, writers are are, are you know kind of like vampires in their dark rooms, you know, like writing by themselves and get away from me, you know that 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 that's kind of the cliche for the writer, but 
Um, but every writer at some point or another shares their writing, whether it's with, you know, whether it's with a producer or, or an agent, um, or they're sharing it, you know, f with a script writing, uh, service where they're getting, uh, you know, feedback from a friend or a relative or a fellow writer, you know, um, that has to happen at some point or another. And, you know, but if you're working with that person, that's different than when you're working with the person that you're sharing the script with. When you're working with them, you both need to have gone through those processes mm -hmm. together. It's important. It's important because otherwise it, there's going to be way too much conflict. And I'm not, yeah. and conflict is good. I'm not talking about like we, we, we have conflict. Yeah. But that's conflict yeah. of like not conflict of you're taking the story in this direction and I'm taking the story in that direction. No, about, it's about dismantling the idea so that we get gold out of it. And so the conflict, what it'll do is we're throwing, we're throwing rocks at the idea. We're throwing, you know, we're trying to slice this thing up so that we can get, you know, a, a delicious plate. You know what I mean? Yep. That's what we're doing. So our conflicts are like, no, but because of this, no, but of that, we should do this, we should do that. And it's literally just beating it till it is, you know, perfect. Yeah. That's what conflict should do. Yeah. That's the whole point. And oftentimes we, we, we adopt the mentality of like, okay, bro, we're, we're, we're disagreeing. And I think that's a good thing. I think that what that is, is that there's a sign that we haven't nailed it mm -hmm. yet mm -hmm. and it's there. Mm -hmm. So we just need to keep talking. Yeah. And that's what one thing that we say. It's uh, and you know sometimes people yeah. will, will look at us and be like you know like oh gosh yeah the, you know yeah, like they're, 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 but <laughs> <laughs> no but what we're doing is like we know we just got to keep talking. Let's yeah. just keep talking, talking, yeah, talking, yeah, talking yeah. back and forth, and right. eventually you're gonna say something brilliant, Jonathan. You're gonna be like, bro, like yeah. this is his motivation. And I'm like, see, that's why we keep talking, you know, yeah, and, right, and because right, it right. was like we went through this you know this loop de loop and all around, and finally it hits you. Mm -hmm. And, and because we kept dialoguing, it wasn't that we were trying to take the, dis, the it, one direction or another. It's just a piece of research needed to pop up yeah. and pop in at yeah, the right yeah. time. It's not about like, it's not about you wanting and you'll have to, we, we have to check ourselves. It's not about you wanting this darling. It's really about really just beating it till yeah. it becomes better. Right. Now, has there ever been a part, a time where we decided not to? to go about this structure and not do research and just write. How did that go? Uh, is there ever a script that you can think of? Oh, plot holes everywhere. <laughs> uh, you're going through this thing and you realize, what did I just watch? What did I just write? And then a lot of that stuff, I mean, that's a lot of the stuff that we did when we were younger. We were yeah, kids, yeah, yeah. you know, like we yeah. would create something that was we love so much and, and passion can blind you from, you know, from actually doing your homework. And so sometimes you'll... That's a bingo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, passion blinds you. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I just, I get excited when you like drop these nuggets. Yeah. That's true. It is. And so you have to be careful that, you know, the story makes sense. Yeah. It just has to, your research has to be in alignment with reality. Yeah. Um, or at least with humanity. Yeah. So that it can connect. Yeah. Yeah, that, it's important. Uh, passion does blind you, and oftentimes you'll find like, well, why is this? Why does this scene have to be in the magic hour with the sun setting and the yeah. and the snowflakes and the flowers and the petals and the yeah. like? And and passion blinds you, and it's like, okay, well, what does research dictate? You know, like, yeah. no, it was a little bit more gritty than that. It mm -hmm. wasn't beautiful. Mm -hmm. Awesome, mm -hmm. cool. I was gonna start uh, name dropping some old scripts and stuff, but maybe it's best that we don't and we just leave it as next time. You know, if. You Part don't two. do the research. You're going to have plot holes. It's going to be ugly and you're going to be depressed. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, why did I do this? Yeah. Um, no, no. Part two. Second part. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more about the actual writing part. Yeah. We're going to get into the breaking that down mm -hmm. and kind of how the story flows. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. That's it. Awesome. Whew, we're alive. We made it through. Time for Creator's Tip of the Week. Jonathan, do you have a... Yeah, Solid so um, I know that we've been creating weight in the water and, um, and you know, you're trying to figure out when you have so much to do. And I know I did all week. Um, I had yeah. to find a way to hear the script rather than read the That's script. That's right. Uh, you've been over over doing some painting continue. in the house. Yeah, yes. Jonathan yes. has been busy. Busy, busy. But but as it's uh, dying down and I get to relax and, uh, you know, I don't have the script in hand or I don't have the computer in front of me, um, I will use an app, 
which I found, which actually worked very well. And I did some good research on trying to find apps that would read to me PDF files. And a lot of them, as you know, are so robotic. And Welcome yeah. to my app yeah. that reads exactly. in this way. Thomas, no, I didn't. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> what? So Margaret, please. Exactly. Come but um, uh, let's see here. It's Speakify. Nope, Speechify. 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 It'll be in the show notes in yeah. case you're interested. Yeah, no, it's it's actually really good. It the the voice actually sounds very human. It actually sounds really That's cool. It's good. It's got different ones, obviously, like like most of them. You got the American, you got the British, you got the Australian, you know. But yeah, I didn't need obviously the the the, the British or the Australian. No. Is it simple. like Siri where you could also have uh, uh, Cookie <laughs> reading? To, yeah, did you know that? That's awesome. Cookie Monster now can give you directions. I don't know if it's Siri or if it's Waze. I think, but it, I think it might be Waze. Yeah. But that's awesome. Like, Take a left at the rotary. I want cookies. <laughs> I was just like, that's I great. don't know whether I am going to get to where I need to be or crash. Or <laughs> I am yeah, in the middle of Sesame Street. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no. It, it gives it, you a human voice. And it that's gives good you a human because voice. sometimes it's so it, th- it, it throws it, you off. There's so many features in it. I just have the basic. I haven't purchased it. That's something I'm going to do. Kind of dig into it. Figure it out more. Yeah. Maybe I'll put it on the notes. Um, but it it was a great source. It pops up and it says, you know, you have 250 words that you've gone through. And now you got to do this. But actually, you just keep hitting play. And it just continues going on. And continue That's reading. Cool. Continue reading. So That's cool. And it's great when, like, when you're on a long drive and, you know, like, yes, yeah, you got to yeah. get through this script. Or sometimes, yeah. you know, actually... Sometimes it's it's good for you to hear your script read back to you. Right, right, right. You know, like as a writer, um, whether you're recording your voice and you're, you know, playing it back and listening to it, because sometimes you're like, ooh, that's, you know, or or I don't know if this ever, ever happened to you where you're reading your script and like it's in your head and it sounds great and then you have to read it out loud for someone else and you hear yourself and you're like, that's not what I meant. And you're trying to like correct it as you're reading yeah, it. Yeah. Um, what's cool about the app is that it, it'll read it for you and you can listen and you can be like, yeah. ooh, that's yeah. what it sounds like? Yeah, you'll end up finding out that you can um, find different things that you didn't think of to edit. Cool. You know, I like, like you, you have your story structure, um, you know, you have your basic things and, and it's not going to have the inflections and all that like, oh, yeah. you know, I'm, and the I'm yelling a- and the ha, so it's ha, 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 ha. You'll, you, I mean, it's kind of hard to get it anywhere. Right. There's no app that does that. But you can focus on the storyline very well. And it actually makes you realize, oh, there's a little plot hole here. And I, and I remember asking you things that I told you. I, there's things that I brought up. Yeah, you did. That weren't, had nothing to do with things that I had brought up before. Right. So it's um, cool. I can't wait until an app is developed. For some uh, you app developers out there, app. Uh, an app that either connects to like Final Draft or Highland yeah. or um, what's the other app, the app that we were using? Celtics um, yeah, Celtic Celtics, however you call it, whatever any of those screenwriting apps is, could that but that connects directly to it and is able to like get the metadata from um, your tabs and your enters and and can then translate that into and knows that it's like oh if, if there's a tab and a character then it gives a new character yeah, voice and if it has parentheses it says yeah, you, you know, can know aggressive or whatever and, and it, it can understand like it. if h a h a h a is together to do it in like a ha 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 you know like as yeah. opposed to ha 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 right that, i can't wait for that kind of an app it'll come I it's think gonna, we, it's if there's someone watching who that's going to you if you can create that app you are insta rich i guarantee it yeah. someone out there we just made you rich hook us up at the patreon oh no wait we'll get <laughs> that in a second uh let me finish with my creator's tip <laughs> of the week What's your all right tip? so my creator's tip of the week um so it's actually uh scriptreaderpro.com scriptreaderpro.com has a ton of resources on there this website has a ton of resources but the one resource that i want to highlight mm-hmm. i'm not going to get into the myriad of things that you can do on it because there's a ton and if you ever have time to go through it it's great for you screenwriters but the one resource that i do want to highlight is their best screenwriting contests to supercharge your career in awesome. 2020 awesome. there's a ton of really bad screenwriting contests out there. As a matter of fact, now with, with services like, um, oh gosh, what's the service the, that we use even for, for contests and, and, and um, festival Yeah, app. oh we just, gosh. We just used it recently. Literally, like, yeah, not too long ago. Either way, film festivals, 
have now gone into the online world. And there are aggregate applications out there that make it super easy for anyone to start a festival. I can start a festival right now. We could start the Harvest Festival and, 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 and claim that we are the greatest and most important and that if you submit to us and give us all your money that you're gonna be discovered. And 99.9 .9 times out of 100, that is false. It's not true and it's unfortunate because mm -hmm. it's, un it's easy to scam people now. It's so easy and that breaks my heart because there are writers out there you know, that they just don't know better and they go on Film Freeway. Film Freeway. That's one of them. And I'm nothing against Film Freeway because Film Freeway has some great festivals on there. Like mm -hmm. Sundance now just signed a deal with Film Freeway. And so awesome. now Sundance is officially shifted over from Without a Box into Film Freeway because Without a Box is closing their doors. Um, nevertheless, because these major aggregate sites are out there, anyone can create one, and you just have to be careful that they're not stealing your money or making you promises that they cannot keep. Some of them are good, some of them are legit. Do your homework, do your research, ask around. However, this um, specific section in the Script Reader Pro gives you the top screenwriting contests, ones that are actually legit, where you're going to get a bang for your buck. They are more expensive ones, but if you can win, for example, these contests, hands down, you're going to be noticed. Either you'll get staffed up um, in, a, in a writer's room, or, or you know, you'll one of your someone will come and option one of your scripts, or even the one that actually won. It's just you know, I mean, the ones that are on here are like the Nickel Fellowship. Obviously, everyone knows that one. That's that is one of the biggest. Um, you've got they've got contest prizes. For example, if you win, they're you know, it's like thirty five thousand dollar fellowships. Wow, awesome. Not not little stuff like legit stuff. Um, the Austin. Um, the Austin Film Festival. Yep. Uh, the Austin Film Festival has a screenwriting competition. As a matter of fact, I believe that um, Craig Mazin and um, and um, John August uh, they're like oversee that, and they've got a pretty cool podcast called Script Notes. Um, and it's that that one's pretty legit. And so go through the list. It's on there. I'll put it in the show notes. It's got a a bunch of them. Final Draft has one. Um, and there's, I think there's maybe 10 to 20 or so. Um, there's a bunch and they are legit, they are good. Um, and you can get some great uh, experience. And, and we, last week I talked about another one, Coverfly. I'm not gonna get into it too much, but you know, Coverfly is one of those where they're up, they're brand new and so they don't ha necessarily have all of the the steam and that they say that they do but they are trying to create something and you can certainly use it for coverage uh, that's certainly good for that but anyway um, check it out uh, it will be in the show notes I will put it on there um, and you will have that information for you know right at your fingertips for scriptreaderpro.com man cool. that's it awesome what a great quite lengthy episode. Yeah, but there's so much more. There's so much more. Well, everyone, thank you so much for watching um, episode 18 of The Harvest Podcast. Uh, thank you so very much to our show producer, Chelsea Cowie, who is in studio. Woot woot, keeping up with uh, notes as we go along. Uh, for any questions that you may have, you can reach me on Twitter at xgarcia at Jonathan Harvest. Or if you have long questions, we actually are really excited about doing an episode where we just answer questions. So we're gonna go through all of your questions, community questions, any thoughts, comments, concerns, ideas that you may have, questions, whatever, submit them through info at mountharvest.com. Info at mountharvest.com. And if you know other people that you know may have questions and you watch this episode and you're like, hey, Remember that question you asked me? You should submit it here because they'll answer it. Like, let people know. Let them know. Um, for more uh, behind the scenes of what we do, you can go to our Patreon, um, the patreon.com forward slash the harvest podcast, and you can, you know, you, you can become a patron there and, 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 and donate and, you know, and, and, and access some behind the scenes. We're actually going about to upload. I got to get on this, but we're going to upload a never before seen, seen, seen from a blood throne. Cool. It was cut from the film. It was the prison scene. Cool. So that's going to be on there. You're going to be able to see some never-before-seen footage. But in order to un access that stuff, you know, you got to become a patron of our awesome Harvest podcast. If you love it, guys, you know, uh, support us. If you don't, cool. Um, we yeah. love you anyway. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to change the things up. If you like what you saw, 
smash that like button. Subscribe. Oh. Okay. Smash. Smash. That's what everyone says. I'm yeah. watching these YouTube videos. Everyone says, smash it. So smash it, man. Don't just look at it. Smash it. Smash that like button. Thanks for watching, guys. Thank you, guys. Join us at the patreon.com forward slash the harvest podcast for some BTS footage of our cinema production life.